We thank you for your love. We thank you for your word as we turn to it now because there's good stuff in here. And what we want to do is hear from you because we want these things to either settle down deep in our heart or be confirmed if we've already heard about them. So we thank you and ask your Holy Spirit to be our real teacher in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to, if you have a Bible, you might want to open it to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we'll be in that book in uh, starting in verse 11. Does anybody need a Bible? We can get one to you. Bring one over. Anyone else? Okay. So, there was an airplane in mid-flight. And it hit a patch of severe turbulence, and the passengers were holding on tight as it rocked and reeled through the night. A lady turned to a pastor who was sitting behind her and said, Hey, you're a man of God. Can't you do something about this? He replied, Sorry, I can't. I'm in sales, not management. <laughs> ha ha. Wow, a courtesy reading of a laugh. That's pretty good. Well, trust me, I'm in sales, not management either. But anyway, just as these passengers were fighting fear, that's a great start. In this section of scripture we'll look at today, we'll see that Paul told Timothy that there is a fight going on, but it's in the spiritual realm, and he had to be ready to take part in it. So I call this message Training for God's Fight Club. So it starts in verse 11. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Okay, that, that thing's pretty powerful. We could probably just go home after reading it. But there's so much I'm going to explain a little bit. He starts off in verse 11. He says, but you, O man of God. So I think right away that this is interesting because in the Bible, the term man of God, those three words in that order, at least in the New King James Version, appears 78 times. Moses, Samuel, Elijah, and David are among the men who are called a man of God. But it's only used two times in the New Testament. And I thought that was fascinating. 76 of the 78 times are Old Testament, two in the New Testament. Now here it's written, obviously, and the other letter to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.17, which is talking about correctly understanding the word of God, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped. You can rightly divide it. You read it, you understand it, you can use it, you can dispense it to people, you can live it, those type of things. But that time it's talking about people in general. Here it refers to a person specifically. I bring this up to say that Timothy must have been pretty special for God to have inspired Paul to write that and use that title about him. I know that Paul thought he was that too. But he tells him, O man of God, flee these things. Well, we need to know why Paul told Timothy basically this whole section 11 through 16. Timothy was placed by God as the shepherd of the church in Ephesus. It was his job to take care of them. But in order to do that, he had to take care of himself too. You have to take care of yourself physically. You have to take care of yourself spiritually. You have to take care of yourself, if you'll allow me to conjugate a word, confessionally. <laughs> you know, being confessed up with God, prayed up. He had to be aware of what to do, and he had to be aware of what not to do. Because there are a lot of do's and there are a lot of don'ts in the Bible. But as Mike Warnke said so well, if you do the do's of the Bible, you don't have time to do the don'ts. So you're good. 
So Paul started out telling Timothy to flee these things. Flee means to run away, to distance one's self from. Now there are times when running away is an act of cowardice. When you are supposed to take a stand and you run. <laughs> That's not good. But there are times when running away is an act of wisdom, such as Joseph, and I don't mean Jesus's, I guess you call him his stepdad, Mary's husband, but Joseph, the second from the youngest of the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel, when he was sold into slavery by his brothers and Potiphar bought him, and he's working in Potiphar's house and he's doing such a good job that Potiphar doesn't even know basically how much bread he has, let alone how much money he has, anything. And Joseph runs it all. God's blessing him. And Mrs. Potiphar, we aren't told her name, so often sinful people in the Bible, we were given their name. God doesn't even give us her name. That's how low she is, I think. She comes after him, and she says, lie with me. And she doesn't mean tell falsehoods. So here she comes after him. Finally, there's no one else in the house. She grabs him. <sighs> lie with me. And I imagine she probably looked good, smelled good, smooth skin, had all the money she needed in Egypt to look great. And his response was, how can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? So what does he do? He, he realizes she's got his robe, so he slips out of his robe and runs away. Sometimes getting out of the situation is the right thing to do. And that's what Paul is telling him here. Temptation is that when temptation is about to overtake you, it's a good thing at times to run. But here, the meaning isn't so much to run in the opposite direction as it is to shun or avoid these things. Sometimes running away can be part of your plan to just stay away from that. For example, something as simple and very tightly drawing you in as an alcohol problem how about just staying away from alcohol? I mean, it sounds so easy. It's so simple. It's so logical. But I've heard people say, it's like my car almost just pulled into the bar on the way home. I couldn't stop it. Or how about driving home another way? You know, there are simple things, praying and asking God. And still, with all that, our temptation can, temptation can overtake us. And I understand that. That's why I think Peter wrote that there is sin for every person that so easily besets us. We so easily give in to the same stupid thing. And we call it stupid because it frustrates us. And, of course, it's sinful. But here Paul started out by telling Timothy to flee these things. Now, what things is he supposed to flee? Well, the things he just listed in the section previously in chapter 6. Evil doctrine, questionings, disputes of words, envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, wranglings, and here's a big one, the love of money. That's quite a list. And I would think that if you know anything about Christianity, to be involved in these things is evil and is wrong and it's sinful. So he says, flee these things. These are good things to flee from. But Paul doesn't stop there. He gives Timothy a list of things to go after. Because even Jesus, when he told the parable of the people that came home and they found basically a bum in their house and the place was a mess, so they kick him out and then they spend all their energy cleaning and they're so worn out they need another vacation so they go away. And meanwhile, the bum's looking for another place to stay. Of course, it's a demon and he can't find a place. So he goes back to where he was. He goes, hey, it's all cleaned up again. This is nice. So he gets seven of his friends and now the status is worse than it was before. Why? Because... Yes, they dealt with the problem. Yes, they kicked him out, but they didn't replace him with something spiritual, something of Jesus. That's the difference. They just left their place vacant. So the same thing will come back, only worse. I've personally experienced that, and I will not go into detail. But <laughs> it happens, so trust me. Or trust the Bible, actually what Jesus says, I'll agree that it does happen. So he says to pursue, which means to seek after eagerly, to earnestly endeavor to acquire. It's a command that Paul gives, basically to hunt or to chase after some object. And I think about people that go hunting, and I can admire them. And I can say, wow, you can get up that early and get in your nobody sees me suit. <laughs> and get up early and get up in the mountains there when the weather's really nasty and the hill goes like this and 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 that's your car back here and you shoot it and then you got to drag it 
all this way and then back to your car and I say, you know, that's awesome. I'm glad you enjoy that. You put so much into that. I just go to Albertsons and they have this wall of meat and I just pick out what I want and put in a cushy little cart and all I have to do is negotiate around a couple ladies shopping, you know? It's not that hard. But if you want to do that hunting, that's great. But you see what I'm saying? He say, the meaning of the word is to, it's almost like you're a hunter, like you're seeking after it. How much do people get into hunting? A lot. They squirt elk urine on themselves. They're really into it because they don't want to smell like a guy, a human, right? You want to smell like whatever attracts that elk. It's just like, and you can tell if you're a hunter, it's like, yeah, you don't really know what you're talking about. But that's okay. You, you get the idea that they're really into it. And that's what he's saying. You need to get really into this. So then he gives him a list of what he should be going after. Just like I mentioned the wall of meat. I like to go shopping with a list. I don't like the list to be here. I like the list to be an actual paper list where I could, and, I, and you can talk to my wife. I, I ask her, do you bring a pencil in with your list? No. How are you going to know you picked it up? It's in the cart. I like to scratch it off. And I think I've told you, I, if I don't have a pencil, I fold it and just like, like fold one little line so I can cover that up and not see it. I don't want to see it. Once it's in the cart, it's done. You know, I need to move on to the next thing. So he's saying, here's your list. Here's your shopping list of what you're to pursue after. Number one is righteousness which is integrity, virtue, purity of life, rightness. Of course, the word right is the first part of the word righteous, so it's correct. And then correctness of thinking, how you feel and how you act. So it's how you think, how you feel, and how you act. It's pretty much all you are needs to be righteous based on what Jesus says, how you're supposed to live. And then godliness, which is piety toward God or godliness. Now it's like piety what is that word? Pie eat. Piety sounds very close to pie eating. And I like to eat pie, so maybe that's what he's talking about. No, it's not at all. Piety means being devoted and dutiful to God. So you're devoted to him, and you do what he asks you to do. So being pious is not a bad thing. We always think, I don't know about you, but I, when I hear of someone pious, I think of someone with a, with a turned-up nose, and they're sucking lemons all their life. They're just you know, they look at you like, what? You, you went to a movie theater? You know, and they turn up their nose at you. That's what I think. No, the actual meaning, what's wrong with being devoted and dutiful to God? Nothing is. So remember the original meaning and just think that they were extremists. <laughs> and then faith, which is not maybe what you think, just basic faith. It's instruction concerning the necessity of faith. That's what he needs to seek after, how to teach people what they need to know so they can accept Jesus. I think that's a great thing. And that ties in, of course, with being faithful and dependable. So the first three things of the six listed, righteousness, godliness, and faith, those are character qualities. What defines you as a person, but as a Christian? And then the next one is love. We could park on that one for a long time. It's agape love. It's God's perfect, pure love. It's treating things. It's, it's seasoning everything with love. Just read for your homework, 1 Corinthians, not now, but 1 Corinthians 13 again, and how without love, no matter what you do, you're just a clanging symbol. You could say all these things. You could recite the best poem, but if you're not loving, it's a waste of time. So don't. Live, live with God's love permeating you and like flowing from you. Here's a great one. Patience means I want it now. No, it doesn't. But it means in the New Testament, the characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety, there it is again, by even the greatest trials and sufferings. So no matter what comes your way from the world, your family, friends, anything, enemies, you will not stray from what God has you to do. So you think of patience as not blowing up at the ones when they come at you, which is part of it. But a big part of it is just, it's kind of a stick to I am going to see this through. And that's what he's saying. And then the last one, gentleness. It's exactly as you might think. Gentleness, mildness, meekness. It is not a bad thing to be meek. Some people think that means weak. They even rhyme. But what it means is you could be the Incredible Hulk size. And if you know who that is, Hulk smash. <laughs> Smashes everything, right? But how about Hulk pick up small, fragile glass? 
So he picks up what we would think of as a glass, and he's picking it up like this, and he's not breaking it. That's strength under control. See what I mean? The strength is there. You can see it. He's huge. He's green. He's mean. But he's not going to even crush a little glass because he doesn't want to. So you have this strength in Jesus, but you're not going to cut it loose. You're just going to keep it under control and be directed by the Holy Spirit. And these last three things, love, patience, and gentleness, are listed by Paul in Galatians 5, 22, and 23 as evidence that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is in our lives, which is, in generally, love described by all the rest of the things. David Guzik said this, the challenge to leave some things and follow hard after some other things isn't just directed to Timothy, but to everyone who would be a man or a woman of God, as opposed to being a man of this world. Because being a man or a woman of this world, I mean, that's pretty easy. You get some opposition, but most of the time, a lot of things come your way. But if you're going to be a man of God, there's going to be some opposition. But stay patient, stay faithful, stay in love with the Lord, and let his righteousness shine through, and be gentle, then you'll be able to do great things for God. And then he says in 12, like tying in with the title, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called. And have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So fight the good fight of faith. Here, this word fight, it doesn't mean to combat. Which is interesting because why did I pick that ring? Because we think of a boxing. You know, a boxing ring is a fight, right? Friday night at the fights. There's a big fight. There's a heavy champion, heavyweight championship fight, whatever. But it doesn't mean to combat. It's rather to contend. It's not really taken from the battlefield, but more from an athletic contest. If you think about it, right now there's, there are two championship series going on in professional sports in America. The NBA, Basketball Association, is having their championship series, and so is the NHL, the hockey. Now, which one do you think is more violent? Most of the time we think hockey is more violent, right? But it's still a contest within rules. If you go beyond the rules... Most of the time you get penalized. They have a little box on the side of the ice you have to sit in for two minutes, five minutes or more, or they suspend you for games because you went too far. Well, how, how do you go too far in a war? A war is like, how do you win a war? Whatever it takes, pretty much. Did we go too far in World War II with the bombs in uh, Japan? Possibly so, but it certainly ended it, right? That's, that's what it took. It's what the government decided, the people decided, so they did it. <clears throat> but you can't drop a bomb during a hockey game, <laughs> okay? You have to play within the rules. So that's what he's saying. But we may lose a battle in this fight here and there, but we're called to keep fighting until the war is over. Now, how do we know the war is over? We don't know when it's over. God does. So we have to keep going. There's a Christian band that used to be around called uh, Sweet Comfort Band, and they had a song called Contender, I think. And they had a, there was a, about a boxer, basically, but it's, it's, it's probably from this section of scripture because they say, I'm going to keep on swinging until I hear the bell ring, and my trainer says that's all. You know, just keep going. That's what we have to do. We don't determine when the war is over. God does. And our battles within it, we continue to fight until he takes us home. So what is the good fight of faith? Well, first, again, the word fight is the word that we get our English word agonize. And you're like, oh, great, God's calling me to agony. <laughs> well, it's kind of true because these things are struggles. That's why it's a fight of good faith. It's hard sometimes, but it also means this. It isn't a one-shot deal. You keep fighting. We are never told to stop fighting. In fact, in this second letter to Timothy, in chapter 4, verse 7, Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So Paul knew he was about to be executed. So he's like, hey, I, I did it. I kept going until basically the trainer threw in the white towel. We're done. You know, it's not quitting, but Paul's done with his part. So the white towel is probably a bad example, but going on. <laughs> so who do we fight in this? Well, the biggest one, our enemy, is the devil. He's the one that we fight the most. But you know who's probably very close second, if not first on occasion? Is our own flesh. 
man, we fight against ourselves. I don't want to do that. We fight against the Lord, honestly, sometimes. We fight against temptations. Temptations come our way. We have to stand up against them. We have to fight. Sometimes we take a stand. Other times we flee. Sometimes the best way to not sin is to run away. (laughs) It truly is. Here's one. We fight against our desire to quit. That's it. I'm done. I can't, I cannot deal with this another day, God. And then another day comes around and guess what? You're still dealing with it. He says, you're not done. Call on me. We have to live our lives, though, in balance between fighting the enemy and building the kingdom of God, being involved in that. There's a balance because we can be so into the spiritual battle that we forget to promote and preach about the kingdom of God and we can be so kingdom of God minded we can be taken down by the battle because we're not fighting we have to be like the men that Nehemiah described in his book in chapter 4 verse 17 Nehemiah was the one that asked the king in captivity if he was a cupbearer and he says he was sad and so the king says why are you sad and he's been praying a lot he heard that Jerusalem's in ruins he says how can I not be sad because my hometown's burnt down The gates are burned, the walls are broken down, da-da-da-da-da. He says, well, what can I do for you? This is what we call a divine appointment. (laughs) This is a moment in time. So he says, well, what I'd like to do is be able to get your permission, if you don't mind, um, to go and fix it. And by the way, while I have your attention, and you seem to be, we seem to be doing okay here, can I have some building materials? (laughs) Can I have some permission and protection? Okay, sounds good. So, All that happened. But what happened? They still had opposition. So this is what they did. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and the other hand they held a weapon. So they were building the kingdom and fighting the spiritual fight really at the same time. And it's what we need to do. We have to be consistently aware of the enemy while at the same time promoting and building the kingdom of God. And then he says, here's an interesting thing too, to lay hold of eternal life. This is how we contend for the faith, fight the enemy, and promote the kingdom of God, is to lay hold of eternal life. It inspires you. Now, lay hold of means to lay hold of or seize upon anything with your hands. How do you grab your salvation? (laughs) Has anybody seen it kind of float by in the room? You go, there it is. I knew it was around here somewhere. And you (laughs) grab it and pull it in. No. No. You can't really grab it with your hands. If you're saved, you can't physically touch your salvation. But you can grab a hold of it as in be assured of it and then live accordingly. Now, it may sound arrogant. I've been told I sound that way sometimes. When I say you can be assured of your salvation, but John, who knew Jesus pretty well, wrote near the end of his first epistle in chapter 5, verse 13. These things I have written to you, who? Who believe in the name of the Son of God, to Christians, that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know, be assured of the fact that you are saved and going to heaven. John who called himself the apostle whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Why did he say that? Because he was shocked that Jesus loved him. Do you remember what John was called before? He's one of the sons of thunder. He's one of the guys who says, hey, they didn't listen to us. Should we call fire down from heaven like Elijah and smoke them? Ha ha! What do you think, Jesus? Can we? And Jesus is like, you guys. (laughs) Wow. Okay. So then that's why he's saying, I can't believe he loves me. I am so blown away. And he says, not only that, I know that I'm saved and you can too. So when you lay hold of that, when you're saying, I don't hope that I'm saved. Of course I do, but I mean, it's assured. I don't want to be saved. I don't wish to be saved. I know it. It's a guarantee. Now, why is that? Because we're so good? No. (laughs) If our salvation depended on our performance, well, on a good day, maybe we'd be assured. But on the bad days, you're kind of like, I don't know. I don't know (laughs) if my salvation is good still. 
praise God, our salvation is not dependent on our performance. It's, it's based, our salvation is based on Jesus Christ and his shed blood and death on the cross. And then, of course, his resurrection from the dead. And you know what? That never changes. Unlike our behavior, when we'll have a good day or a bad day, Jesus always has good days. He always had obedient days and always will. And so we are assured of salvation because it's not the size of our faith. It's the size of the God in whom we have our faith that assures us of salvation. So Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, just in case you're thinking, I don't know what I'm talking about. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not performance, not obedience, grace. And it's not of yourselves. It's not because you're so spectacular. As I like to say, I'm not all that in the bag of chips. I'm not even the bag, okay? It is the gift of God here, which means what? We're so lame, we have to have it given to us. That's okay. He knows all about that, and he loves us. Here's this God, this awesome God, and he loves us. And it's not of works, lest anyone should boast. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation, and one of the reasons why is so when we get to heaven, we don't brag. Because if we could get to heaven and brag based on our works, I, I know that I'd be up there and look at somebody and go, I'm saveder than you are. <laughs> it's like, stop. No, he's not going to let that happen. Because we are saved. Why? Because God is gracious. We get saved by accepting his gift of salvation. But we are saved because God is gracious. It's just true. And then to which you were also called. So basically this means this. Timothy was drafted into God's army for war, spiritual battles. He was called by God. I remember when, when I got my letter in the mail, because I had gotten a letter saying that um, I needed to register for the draft, so I did. Actually, I didn't for a while because there was no draft because Richard Nixon... As one guy said, my favorite president, <laughs> who stopped the uh, draft, but he said um, we didn't have to have drafts, so I didn't fill out my information, and then they said, oh, well, you need to register, and I had to go down to the draft board and handwrite my letter explaining why I didn't register. I couldn't even type it, handwritten. So I turned it in, and they said, okay. They accepted the fact that I'm an airhead and didn't think there was, I needed to register. So then I was in college, yeah, I did go to college a couple of years, and I was in college, so they classified me. I think it was called 1H or something, and then they sent me another form, which I disregarded, and they sent me another letter after that, which I opened, and it said, well, since you neglected to return that, you are now classified 1A, random sequence number 52. I don't know if you know, but there are 365 days in a year, so 52 is pretty high. Should the draft be rein reinstated, I'd, go I'd be gone. So I got my draft letter. Timothy got a draft letter of sorts from God. You are in my army now, but it's okay because he also have confessed the good confession. Timothy also volunteered. When he heard God wanted to draft him, he says, I'm signing up. I'm going for it. So this shows that God has a plan and he's going to carry it out. And Timothy's enlistment simply validated the fact that God drafted him. So it was pretty cool. And then in the presence of many witnesses, there are many people around Timothy who could see, yes, he's called of God. And this also could refer to time served that Timothy had as a Christian and then as a pastor. They could agree. Because there's one thing that will show up. If you're working, shall we say, as a pastor, and yet God isn't the one who called you, it'll come out eventually. <laughs> it'll be obvious. He's not godly. It's, not, it's like uh, J. Vernon McGee when he was in Bible college. <laughs> and there was a schoolmate of his, a classmate, who was teaching on Sunday nights at a local church. And he went to listen to him once. He said, that's it. I can't listen to this guy again. This is terrible. And so a cla another classmate, a third one, wanted to go hear the guy preach. And McGee says, well, not me. And he says, you're coming. So he dragged him. And he, they sat and listened to him, just kept looking at each other like, What? It's just all over the map. So we asked, they asked a guy afterwards, said, how much studying did you do? He goes, well, I didn't study at all. He says, what? He says, no. Holy Spirit inspired this. And the other, the other student next to McGee says, don't you dare blame that message on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's like, no way. So it'll be evident. If it's not of God, it'll be clearly shown. 
And then verse 13, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things. We need to pause here because this is a non-negotiable aspect of Christianity. It's like one of those times when I go, are you listening? Is this on? Can you hear me? All right. Okay. The Bible clearly teaches that God created everything. He is where all this came from. He is where you came from. Now, we use the word everything so freely today. Like if things are going bad around us and someone comes up and goes, what's wrong? Everything. Well, probably not everything. First of all, your hearing's working, right? Because <laughs> you heard him ask you that question. Your brain's functioning because you process. You see what I'm saying? There are things that not everything literally is going wrong. But here, in this case, it's true. Everything that was created, God did it. Everything we know of and all the things that we don't know of, all the little bugs that fly around in dust particles and yeah. Anyway, all of it was created by God. And then here's a little extra credit. Same one, John, I talked about him earlier in his gospel in chapter one, tells us it was Jesus who did the creating. So in this verse, as an extra is calling Jesus Christ God. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things. Yet Jesus is God, so he's the one who created all things, so he must be God. Pretty interesting thing, kind of a, a backdoor version of a verse that gives Jesus credit as being God. Because speaking of Jesus in John 1 verse 3, all things were made through him. How many? All made through him. I won't go into it. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In other words, he's the one who did it all. Okay. One other aspect of this we have to be aware of. So not only do people deny that Jesus was the creator, there are also those who deny that we had a creator at all. I'm trying to remember the name of the show that um, Ben Stein, you know who that is? The actor who played the one teacher in Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Bueller. Bueller. He's really good at looking bored. The guy's made a lot of money looking like he's disinterested. Yeah. <laughs> and he does those clear eyes commercials, you know. Anyway, he did a, um, I'm trying to remember what the name of the movie was, but it was basically a, uh, not even saying that God created everything, but an intelligent designer had to. That creation screams that somebody put this together. It didn't just happen. And he, he presented such a clear case that a devout atheist evolutionist said that he agreed that Ben Stein was right, but he refused to accept the position of creationism because if he accepted that, well, then he'd have to answer to God. He can't do that. Isn't that amazing? Expelled, that's the name of the movie. I try to think of a first service, wow. Anyway, so not everything's wrong now. Things are fixed, right? <laughs> but if there's no creator, there's no one to be accountable to, and that is, means it's open season for sinners to do their thing. And then he says, and before G Christ Jesus is who this, his calling is, is seen by, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate doesn't mean that Jesus saw the good confession. It means he witnessed it. He stated it himself. It was Jesus Christ who gave this commission to Timothy. And Jesus knows what it's like to tell worldly people things that are true about God, whether they're going to want to hear it or not, because he's done it himself. Timothy knew what he had to do, and that was to do what Jesus did before Pilate. What did Jesus do before Pilate? Well, he agreed with him that he's the king of the Jews. He says, you say that I am. That's right. And he told Pilate, because Pilate says, do you not know I have a power to take you out? And he says, you don't have any power at all unless my father <laughs> gives it to you. And he has. He's given it to you, but you wouldn't have any power at all unless he gave it to you. And then he th I think he did the hardest thing there was to do, and that is to not defend himself against all the false accusations. Isn't it hard when people bring up false accusations? But, 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 start as W.C. Fields, stop talking like a motorboat. But, 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 but. It's so hard not to do that. And this isn't meant as an impossible standard to live up to, because none of us can be like Jesus 100%, of course, ever. But it's an inspiration. These are the things Timothy is called by Jesus to do. Now, how good was Timothy's performance expected to be? Well, verse 14, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless. Oh, no problem. I could do, wait, what? Well, the commandment in context is the list that he just gave in verses 11 and 12. We went over it earlier. And the idea without 
of being without spot. This is what I like because it comes from the Greek word which literally means a garment without any permanent spots. I have what I can't call anything else but a t-shirt collection. I have so many t-shirts. My mother-in-law years ago was doing our laundry and she's like, how many t-shirts do you own? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> but I have drawer after drawer after shelf in the closet of t-shirts and I go through them and I'm like, this one, nope, 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 nope. Nope, nope. Oh, I haven't worn that one in a while, but I, I can't today because it's Tuesday and, and I'm just on and I have so many. But the one thing I can't stand is a grease stain on the front. I, oh, it just drives me nuts. My wife and I have found a magical cure for that. Just lay the shirt down on the counter and take Dawn dishwashing soap liquid and squirt a little on there and just rub it in with your fingernails some. Wash it in hot water. It comes out of the dryer. Ding. It's gone so wonderful. It's this type of thing. We get spotted by the world. We, we, get, we commit sins. But as long as those sins can be washed out by the blood of Jesus, they're not permanent. So to be without spot doesn't mean to be sinless, because we never match up with that. We hear that and go, oh, forget it. No, it just means without some kind of a stain that would just be non-removable. I'm not even sure what that would be uh, other than blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Everything else is removable. But in other words, just to live your life using the dawn when you need to. But other than that, stay away. We went to the movies on Tuesday night. I went to see the new Star Wars solo, uh, solo stories. I loved it. But anyway, so sometime I was eating a hot dog before it, and I think the hot dog leaked on me, and it's just this strange grease. and went way down on one of my favorite t-shirts in my collection and I was shocked when I saw it. I was like, oh, it wasn't even wet. It was dry. It's a grease stain. Dun, dun, dun. But I did the Don trick and it's gone. I can still wear it. I would not be able to wear it if it had the grease stain. I have to turn it into a rag and it's one of my favorites. But going on. And then he says, it, what that means metaphorically, it means to be clean, pure, and free from immorality. Do you know that that same word is also used to refer to an unspotted lamb? And who was Jesus? Our perfect lamb, the sacrifice, unspotted, without spot. So that's what he's calling us to do. And then blameless. That means so there can be no occasion for reproach or reproof. No one can truly blame you for something if you didn't do it. So just don't do it. Don't commit it. And if you do, fess up. But if you don't, you don't have to. You have to fess up to something you didn't do. And this also refers to keeping the commandments of Jesus. As Adam Clark said, keep the truth and the truth will keep thee. I love that. You keep the truth and it'll keep you. So how long was Timothy supposed to keep this up? I mean, was it a couple of weeks, a year? Until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing. So I guess Timothy's still around, right? Because <laughs> Jesus hasn't come back? No. Paul figured Jesus was coming back any time. And you know, every generation of Christians since then has. And why is that? Because Jesus said he would return. He just didn't say when. But we know it could be any day now. We had a saying, we have the God is good all the time saying, well, we have another one around here we haven't used for a while. I say Jesus is coming and you say maybe today. So Jesus is coming. Maybe today. And maybe today. Jesus is coming. And if not today, tomorrow. We can always say that. We have to always be ready just in case he comes back. And then 15, which he will manifest in his own time. That's when the return of Christ is going to happen. It's the answer to anyone who asks you, well, when will your Jesus return? He's coming back in his own time. You can use a modern thing. You can say hashtag his own time. Not mine, not yours, his. Because he is the blessed and only potentate. So not only is Jesus the blessed one, which also means the nature of that which is the highest good, he's also the only potentate. I love that. It sounds like some Native American word. Hmm, me chief potentate, doesn't it? But it means ruler, sovereign, one who wields great power or sway as God man. That is a great description of Jesus. So because he's that, he's also this, the king of kings and lord of lords. Now in our 
society, down here on earth. Kings are powerful. Lords of kingdoms have great authority. But Jesus is the one who is the king's king. He's the Lord's Lord, the one that all of us have to answer to. No king or lord on earth comes anywhere near the majesty of our king and lord, Jesus Christ. It's good to know. So those are the things that build up how awesome he is, but there's even more. Because being God, he has ultimate authority and power and glory. And Timothy was now equipped to fight the good white, the guy, good fight. Now, why is that verse 16? Who alone, speaking of Jesus still, has immortality. Now, immortality means not subject to death. Now, man, people, ladies, gentlemen, Bums and tramps, cross-eyed mosquitoes and bow-legged ants, as we used to say when I was a kid. Man is subject to death, but God is not. Jesus Christ is the only one who has died, risen from the dead. Wait a minute. Didn't he raise people from the dead? Pretty famous guy, Lazarus, right? Widow's son. Didn't Elijah raise? Yeah, they did, but Jesus did it never to die again. All these other people had to die again. I don't know if they look forward to it or not, but they did. When we die, our soul will go to be with the Lord instantly, but our bodies will still be here dead. If you don't believe it, know someone who's a Christian and visit the funeral home or go to the hospital or whatever. You'll see them. Their bodies are here. It's an old tent. It's empty. They're not there. Eventually, when Jesus calls the believers to heaven at the rapture, all the dead bodies of the believers will rise, be changed to be immortal, but for now, Jesus is the only one who's done that. So he's the only one who has immortality. This one, this title is so cool. He dwells in unapproachable light. It's a fascinating description of God. Because the closest thing I can think of is our sun. Not my son, Jason, but the sun in the sky. According to people who measure these things, it's 93 million miles away, and we still can't look at it with the naked eye. Last year when the eclipse was happening, it was fascinating. You got the special glasses. Did you get them? I did. Went outside and looked. Oh, that's really cool. It looks like someone took a bite out of it, and now they're taking another bite, bigger, 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 so there's just a little tiny toenail sliver, and then it came back. But you wouldn't be able to tell because even looking at an eclipse, it's almost worse. I guess because you think it's safer, so you look longer, but it's terrible. But God is the one who made the sun. So he's brighter. Psalm 104, verse 2 from the NIV, the Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. Matthew 17, 2, Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Acts 22, 6, when Paul is recounting his conversion process. Not when it happened earlier in Acts, but this is telling some other people about it. As I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, that's an added fact we didn't get in the first telling when it actually happened. So it's around noon. The sun's pretty much straight up. It's brightest. Jesus appeared. Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. Have you ever noticed during the day that you left your porch light on? How do you notice it? Either you happen to look at the bulb or the switch is on. But you can't, it doesn't affect the day. You don't turn, it, turn off your porch light and it gets dark in that area around your house, right? It's just the sun is so powerful. It's so bright. Jesus is out shining the sun. And then in heaven, Revelation 21, verse 23, the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And then 1 John 1, 5 through 7. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But it's also interesting that he says, whom no man has seen or can see, here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now, Jesus is God. Plenty of people saw him. So what does, what does Paul mean? No one has seen God in totality. Now, why is that? Well, Moses asked to see the glory of God. It's actually a very gracious thing for God not to let us see him. 
Moses and God were good friends. It says that they talked like one man talks to another face to face. But God answered Moses in Exodus 33, verse 20. He says, show me your glory. And he says, you cannot see my face. So he let him see his back. He says, for no man shall see me and live. Obviously, we'll see God when we get to heaven, but we'll have a new body, a new nature. Sin nature is gone, so we can survive it. David Guzik says this, God is holy. And I'll interrupt that quote by saying this. I don't think we have a real concept of the holiness of God, the purity, the brightness of how wonderful he is. Jesus is not merely a superman. He is the God man, truly immortal without beginning or end with a glory which, if fully revealed, would strike any human dead. So I'm, I'm grateful he doesn't do that. But it's, it's amazing, isn't it? That's how awesome and pure and holy God is. And then he closes, he says, To whom be honor and everlasting power, amen. We really do owe God our honor. And why is that? Because he is perfect. He is sovereign. He is eternal. He is omnipresent, which means everywhere, simultaneously. He is immutable, which means he never changes. He's righteous. He's just. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He is literally perfect. And in addition to that, God is good and all the time. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for how wonderful you are and how you've shown us enough of a peak, of a glimpse of you to realize not only are you wonderful and holy, but we are so sinful by comparison. It embarrasses us how we are, yet you fixed it. You made it so we can have fellowship with you. You made it so you can dwell inside us. <coughs> that is such wonderful news. So we thank you, Lord, for salvation. We thank you for what we celebrated with communion. The fact that you became sin for us. So, Lord, as we go today, pray that we would just remember that you're God and we're not, and it's a good place to be. In Jesus' name, amen.